This time on the uh, on on the Romford quick interviews that are going to be heading out onto the Facebook and the social medias, I am joined by director Justin Eugene Evans, who is hey hey <laughs> who is bringing the short movie Honor Amongst Thieves, starring Jason Armour and Michael B. Tab, which at the festival has been nominated for two awards. It's been nominated for best supporting actor for Michael B. Tab and best screenplay for Justin yourself. Um, That's great to hear. How, how are you this fine evening and how have you been keeping in these, these mental, mental times? Um, oh, well, you know, uh, it's, it's 5 p.m. here in, in uh, New Berlin, Wisconsin. I live in the American Midwest and uh, things are actually really good. You know, uh, America has not handled the COVID-19 crisis well. Um, but the, you know, I, I decided to, you know, there's a light that we actually use to illuminate uh, Honor Among Thieves. And I was able to pivot that technology and turn it into a UVC sterilization system. And uh, Fortune 500 companies across the US are now purchasing it. We just sent 15 systems to Bell Helicopters, which is a massive corporation here in the US. And, um, We've had two of the largest medical schools test it, and uh, they say it's the most powerful medical grade sterilizer in the world. And, and so now we're actually using it to reopen Hollywood. We've got meetings with Netflix. So, so that, that's what I've done to keep busy during the COVID-19 crisis. That is the best answer I've had so far. I've oh. genuinely been Tony Stark and things. <laughs> I'm an inventor first and a filmmaker second. And... Um, and so uh, I spent, you know, upwards of seven to eight hours a day either reading articles at, on, on the NIH website, which is the National Institute of Health, mm. and has the most respected uh, peer-reviewed studies. Um, and that informs a lot of how I want to take an invention. I've got en engineers that I work with, um, and I've got an engineering company. Um, called Evans Works that does my inventions. Humble Magi makes my movies, and um, and so so you know I I've had a few people say I'm I I'm the chubby uh, Tony Stark. <laughs> so, hey, if you if you're going to be the chubby anyone, <laughs> yeah, a absolutely. So um, and and a lot of it also comes from the fact that I'm autistic, and and so I'm really comfortable around the geeky, nerdy science elements of filmmaking. You know the. I, I was probably more obsessed with how cameras worked at first than, than what I should be pointing them at. And, um, and so, so that's my, I've, I've always had this dual love of the science side of the film industry and the art side of the film industry. That's so cool. <laughs> that, that went somewhere I totally wasn't expecting. So um, first of all, uh, honor, honor Amongst Thieves, we're, we're, we're going to talk a little bit about that. It's showing at the festival. Um, I genuinely, genuinely love this movie, as you, as, as you said before, the, the preamble. Thank you very much. That means a lot to me, uh, because it was a scary film to make. I can uh, when imagine. I first, I, when I first pitched it to, to a few of the people who, who were involved, I said, we're going to make a, a sci-fi Western. And they said, are you nuts? That's mm. never worked. And I said, that's why I want to do it. You know, yeah. Cowboys and Aliens did it so very, very wrong. And it's an opportunity for us to show that, that we really know how to do a genre mashup. Mm -hmm. And um, I've always been an Anglophile. So there's, I'm sure you can see there's, there's a Doctor Who influence in, in the material. Uh, there's a Firefly influence. Yeah. Um, and, and I'm a nerd at heart. It, it's what I, what I would like to believe is uh, I, what I'm trying or aspiring to be as a filmmaker is sort of the Aaron Sorkin of the nerd world. Nice. And for me, it's always about dialogue and the rhythm of dialogue, the snappy patter back and forth, yeah. the almost musicality of it. But I don't, what I, what, I, what I absolutely love is Star Wars movies and the best Marvel movies and, and the best seasons of Doctor Who. Mm -hmm. um, uh, my wife and I get in a fight of who the best Doctor Who is. It's it's Matt Smith, but she disagrees. She's <laughs> she's absolutely certain that it's David Tennant. Um, so Tennant's um, a good one. Tennant is a good one. He's see the thing is Tennant's probably the best Doctor, but the visual effects and the writing is yeah. is good for his seasons, and so it's hard to repeat the episodes. Matt Smith, the writing is so sharp, and the visual effects are there. The production value is finally 
on par with a big budget television show mm. that I, I find um, that the Matt Smith era is what I, I tend to repeat. Plus, plus Amelia Pond is just the most adorable um, assistant. So, so I guess you kind of dealt with that a little bit there. Um, what would be, this is a question I always ask people to do because I am terrible at doing it, but what would be sort of your elevator pitch for Honor Amongst Thieves? My, my elevator pitch, see the, the short film is different than what I intend to do the long term. And yeah. so lo and long term, we're, we're already developing it into a, a full-fledged four season television series. Um, so, so the, the short film's got a different pitch. The short film is quite simply, uh, hey, what happens when you take Doctor Who and Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid and slam them together? That's the short film. Um, and there's even a scene from Butch Kiss Cassidy and the Sundance Kid that it is based on. Uh, in the opening of Butch Cassidy, uh, they have a failed tri train robbery where they use way too much dynamite and they blow up the whole damn train. And... Uh, Butch and Sundance come back to the hole in the wall gang and he has to fight for control over his crew. Mm -hmm. And, and just that was the inspiration to me that I go, now, wouldn't it be cool if we could do a sci-fi movie and it's all about what's, what's not normally the big event? The big event is the robbery. The big event is breaking out of prison. But what if this is the aftermath of that and everybody hates each other's guts? Mm -hmm. And so, so that, that's the short film. The, the feature, the, the television series that, that we're currently developing um, expands this significantly and it's actually a science fiction version of the Count of Monte Cristo. And oh, nice. uh, Jason Moore's character, John Thurston, is actually Edmond Dantes. And so it is the story of someone from the 24th century who is stuck in the 19th century because that actually is his prison and how does he get back to the 24th century and exact revenge upon those that destroyed his life? Yeah, that, that's an awesome pitch. Like, um, just, just make that no. Just can we have that no? <laughs> We're trying really hard. We're trying really hard. And Jason, Jason's attached. Um, uh, Jason would star in it. Jason uh, has far better relationships and connections than I do mm. uh, in Los Angeles. And so um, we'll see if he can move that forward. You're right. You don't see the big action piece that sort of happened in the background. You just kind of get thrown into what could potentially be like the middle of the story or the end of the story even. And, right. and I'm guessing that was always a, a conscious choice. Like you, they were going to show this, this particular conversation. Is yes. that, was that more of just like a, a proof of concept? No, this was a very deliberate choice and it comes from, I, you know, I've got probably four major influences as a writer. It's yeah. uh, Mark Twain, Shakespeare, uh, Aaron Sorkin and Quentin Tarantino, and that's a hell of a so, Mount Rushmore. What's that? That's a hell of a Mount Rushmore. <laughs> and uh, Aaron Sorkin's sort of top of my list. I think Aaron Sorkin is the American yeah. William Shakespeare. There's things that he does with the language that are just marvelous. But more importantly, he has a skill of making the most interesting thing be set in what normally would be the most boring setting. I always wonder if like he's, he did such a good job with a few good men doing the safe courtroom drama that he decided after that, well, we'll just, do, we'll just set the scenes in all the places that normally would be considered boring. And, and for me, that was the same challenge was, well, of course we could have done a train robbery. And uh, particularly where we were shooting, there were multiple trains we actually had access to, 19th century refurbished Wild West trains that are still on like a limited track and they go about 15, 20 miles. It would have been perfect. And no one was using them because we were shooting in the middle of winter. But I, I thought, no, that's, that's safe, that's tired, it's been done, everyone expects that. I want to subvert people's expectations. And instead, it's right as the two people jump out of the time portal. Mm -hmm. And we have no, no, no clue. I was about to uh, uh, probably be a little uh, more colorful. Uh, we have no clue what, what horrors they have seen um, and it's just hinted at. I think my favorite line from the movie um, is when uh, Sam Spurlock says, monsters, monsters with guns. And that's all you need to know, that they must have seen some terrible, terrible things on another planet. So, uh, but the only way you can pull this off and not make it cheap is the visual effects that you do have have to be stellar. Yes. And so uh, I'm very lucky the visual effects artists that I worked with are all industrial light and magic. 
uh, visual effects artists, they've all done like big budget Marvel mm -hmm. movies. And um, when we sat down, I said, look, there, there's only about a dozen big visual effects in this film, mm -hmm. but they have to be perfect. And so we spent two and a half months on, on the visual effects that are, that are in the motion picture. Um, and some are really subtle. Some would never know. Like we, we did a lot of additional work with the sky because we were shooting in the middle of winter in Santa Fe. Yeah. And there's no camera in the world that can actually pick up a star field. So even though these were cloudless nights, the stars just aren't bright enough to be picked up by the camera. So all the stars that you see in the background, all the skies, the bits of clouds and, and what have you, all of that um, is a visual effect. There's little bits of enhancements that we did uh, to the city um, because you could actually see far in the distance a little bit of Santa Fe and we needed to digitally erase that. Um, uh, but the big things that we knew had to had to work was the moment that space portal opens, yeah. you have to go, wow, I could see that space portal in a Marvel film. Um, and we knew that the use of, of the guns and the other weapons that John has hidden on him had to be awesome. And, and I got lucky that I've got really good people I, I work with. The cast, J Jason Moore and Michael B. Tab, just these two guys are just fantastic. Yeah. Where, where did you come across these guys? Are they people that you already knew or, or was it just sort of like casting wise? Um, I knew both of them previously. Jason and I have, uh, worked on a feature film about seven years ago, eight years ago called A Lonely Place for Dying. Ah, yes. And he was uh, a smaller role in it and we ended up forming a friendship while we were making that. Uh, he was only on set for like three or four days and I just loved the hell out of him. He's a great, 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 great guy. Mm -hmm. and, um, uh, and, and I also found one of the things that we ended up bonding over is that he could look past some of my autistic traits. Right. Uh, people often say like, particularly because you know, I, I've had public speaking training. And so when I'm in an interview like this, people say, you don't seem autistic, which is really kind of a backhanded compliment. Um, <laughs> and, uh, uh, and I've struggled in Hollywood because I can stick my foot in my mouth. I'm not as socially graceful. Jason has had other friends uh, that are on the spectrum. And so he immediately, uh, you could either say understood autistic people or was willing to put up with some things that, that uh, other highly social people would not put up with. So we've just had a really great relationship. Michael Tab and I met the very first day we both started NYU film school. And so I've known him since I was 19. And um, I, I was transferring to NYU as a sophomore into the film school. He was transferring into uh, NYU um, in the acting department. And they have this big giant sort of mixing, uh, mixer thing in a big hall. Yeah. And you grab a very, various, various buttons that represent what you want to do with your life. And I picked director, writer, producer. And everyone thought that was quite pretentious. And <laughs> Michael, I think, picked like actor and then probably scribbled on one movie star. Um, and you put these on your hat. And I'm like, you're an arrogant guy, just like me, we should be friends. So that's, that's been you know, a, a 25 year friendship. And as I was writing this, I knew that the role was perfect yeah. for him. He, he is phenomenal. The, the second he kind of slams those saloon doors open, like yeah. you just, you, you, it's funny because I was instantly thought of, um, you, know, you know, Ian McShane and Deadwood. Like he had that kind of graceful sort of like brashness, if you know what I mean, which which is yeah. total oxymoron, but it kind of works. Um, but as soon as he comes out those saloon doors, I'm just like, I love this guy. This guy's going to be awesome. <laughs> he, there's a Falstaffian quality to him. He there's a, a bit that reminds me of like, um, oh, why am I spacing on his name? Doesn't matter. So I agree with you 100. percent There's there's that that scary. Uh, and, and it's it's because they both have that voice. So Ian McShane has a voice that if you heard that from around the block, uh, you'd shiver in your boots. And Michael Tab can do exactly the same thing with his voice. And and the irony of this is my my son, even though we'd been friends for years, uh, my son had never met Michael before we shot the film. Mm -hmm. So uh, my son had only seen the finished film. And when he met Michael for the first time, uh, he whispered to me, he goes, he's such a nice guy. <laughs> don't understand and I was like David he's an actor so yeah. in the real world he is just a big cuddly teddy bear uh only on camera does he come across like a terrifying sociopath
I need I need an answer to this. Um, the teddy bear. Oh. What on earth? <laughs> I absolutely love it, and it's it's one of those moments where he's he's taken all his gadgets and gizmos out of his coat, right. and then he unleashes a teddy bear. Right. What's what's the story behind this? Okay, so this this shows what a big nerd I am. That the teddy bear is inspired by Frank Miller's uh, The Dark Knight Returns. Yeah. So there's there's a couple characters that the joke no not the Joker who are they the Joker's children. I can't remember, but there's th- there are these very grotesque little uh, dolls that are semi sentient, and uh, one of the villains is sends these these f- sort of grotesque semi sentient doll like children uh, to go be bombs, and and they detonate. And so you see this little kid flying through the air, um, and then foul language comes out of its mouth. It detonates, and a hundred people die. Yeah. And and I'd always been fascinated by that juxtaposition of what appears innocent and is actually incredibly dangerous. Mm-hmm. And um, and so I thought, well, you know, if John is going to have a secret weapon on him, it's going to be the most dangerous uh, bomb in the in, in the galaxy. And, and that would be a pink teddy bear with LEDs inside of it. And if, and if you notice, we even torched it. We actually put it on a barbecue and burnt the living hell out of it. Um, so it looks like it's been you know, through hell and back and, and been used a couple times. Um, and, and then the sound designer absolutely nailed uh, this creepy little voice that you hear in the background that says boom, boom time. Boom, boom time is a dangerous thing. You don't yeah. want to go through boom, There's boom. There's a fantastic gun in the movie that is very, very steampunk for me. And and just tell, tell me a little bit about the design of this because that thing's badass. Well, I... I have to give credit where credit is good due. And so there's a, a company in, in uh, Indiana called uh, Wolfgar Props. Right. And um, it's run by, by a guy who's a nerd just like me. And, um, uh, you know, the, the American Midwest has a tendency to be looked over a lot. And uh, there's guys like me that are scattered around that are obsessed with, in my opinion, the right movies. Yes. Um, details of the right movies. And... Um, Without really having a full business model in place, he's, he, he was a big cosplayer and he started developing really great, high-end, but affordable uh, weaponry. And so he would full armor, all sorts of stuff. If you go on his website, it's absolutely amazing. And so he'd had a rough draft for this particular weapon um, on his website, but we did some additional enhancements. And, uh, and this is the final draft version here. Jason Moore actually has uh, one of these as well, because we have two. Uh, just in case one got broken on set. Um, so um, it expands on its own, and that's with the flick of a button right here. So, and that releases it. Um, the other thing that's cool is it's got an on off switch here. Oh, yes. And we really thought through the sound effects of it. So it has a limited number of shots, and then you have to cock it to reload it. Oh, nice, nice. And then now it's reloaded, um, but it's gotta be right for film. And so it has a little tiny hidden switch. And what that switch does is turn off the audio. And so now I can use it on camera when we're actually shooting uh, uh, photography and I don't have to worry about the sound effects being uh, captured in, in the sound reel. And uh, we managed to, to get this completely done and built and the whole works for about a hundred US dollars. And, you know, Hollywood will spend $20,000 on something like that, which is why their budgets are what they are. Very nice. I'm a big and, fan of, uh, of the, whole, the whole steampunk thing. So when you, when you get little bits of that in places that you're not necessarily expecting, it yeah. works. It works for me. But I assume, I, I'm hoping you agree with me on this. I hate it when steampunk is done wrong. And so for me, bad steampunk is when people just glue gears on top yeah. of stuff and there's no logic to it. And, and to me, the whole point of steampunk is that it's supposed to be like William Gibson's difference engine. It's supposed to be what could have been if smart people had had access to investment capital and done what they could with the technology of the time. It is not gluing glasses onto a hat with a chain coming down the side, and it doesn't make any sense. That's yeah. bad steampunk. That does and, be the go-to. 
<laughs> it drives me crazy. So, so everything about this was really thought through in terms of what is its function, yeah. um, how does it work, and then only last, and what will it look like on camera? Um, if it's just aesthetics, then it's silly, <laughs> in my opinion. So this this has been absolutely fantastic. I've, I'm, th you know what? I, I could probably go for another two or three hours talking about these kind of things. Where we both seem like two very big nerds, which is always a plus when it comes to interviews for me. Um, but I want people where if if people are down in Romford round about the time the festival's on, I want people to check out Honor Amongst Thieves. If they're not there, um, where can people possibly check this out? Is it is it going to be available for people to to see online? Or is it mostly just the festivals just now? Right now we're just in festivals yes. and we'll be doing that for at least another six to nine months. Eventually we will release it on YouTube, awesome. uh, but that's not until it's completed its festival run. So for right now, the only place to see it is Rumford. Awesome. Awesome. That's what we like to hear by the way. <laughs> so um, I'm, I'm going to let you go, but first of all, what other things apart from the TV show that you're working on and trying to, trying to get out there? Is there anything else that you can tell people about or where they can find you or just tell people to go and watch the film? <laughs> well, watch the film. And, uh, and if you want to check out what, what made the movie possible, uh, go to anthem1.com and, and look at the lighting system that we invented to make the movie. That is and, amazing. Uh, that's, that's about it, I, I suppose. That, 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 I'm not going to lie, that completely threw me off at the start of this interview. <laughs> I was kind of like... <laughs> There's one thing you should know about the movie. I mean, we just finished a British feature film with it, um, a feature film called 400 Bullets. And um, I actually served as the gaffer on the movie. Uh, I, I was spent the whole uh, uh, part of November and December in, in, in the Midlands uh, shooting the film in the middle of an empty potato field. And... Uh, the whole point is to bring the Hollywood quality lighting and the scope of a Hollywood movie, but down to what an independent filmmaker can easily do with just two people. And I'm really lucky that a couple of British filmmakers were the first to really trust the system. Mm -hmm. And so we, we made this ambitious motion picture that is the story of these two guys, two British uh, special forces um, in Afghanistan and each of our sets was like Humvees and tanks battling in the middle of, of a very large field. And our entire grip and lighting department was two people. It was me and one other person. And, <laughs> and most of the scenes we were lighting with as few as four lights. And one of our lights, which runs on 200 watts, uh, can light half an acre. And it's, it's because of that, that Honor Among Thieves looks the way it does. And yet we had an incredibly tiny crew. And, and very soon you'll, you'll be able to see 400 bullets at a film festival in the UK and see what it can do on an even grander scale. I genuinely, genuinely enjoyed the movie and can't wait to see what you do in terms of a, in terms of a series. I think that would be awesome. Thank you very much. Man. It was good to meet you.